Well, glory. Good evening. I have the precious privilege of bringing a word from the word to you this evening. We're going to be in the book of John, chapter 12. I want to begin this study some months ago in the book of John. I didn't plan it out to wind up at an Easter time message as Easter was approaching. It just kind of happened that way. And of course, then it also happened that we didn't get to be together face to face for that message. And although I've already delivered a message uh, by video to you regarding Easter, we're getting right back to that time in the course of studying the book of John. And so although I preached out of a different passage for Easter service, uh, we're going to be rehearsing some of the same uh, uh, episodes in the life of Christ. And so if some of these things uh, tend to be a little bit uh, uh, repetitive, uh, you'll bear with me. This particular passage tonight that we'll begin looking at in verse 1, however, was not one of those passages that we covered in that study. And so we have the privilege of looking at three very wonderful saints of the Lord. And of course, we focused on Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, for a couple of weeks now. And yet we'll get this third message of vignette in their life. Just a little look-see into who they were and what they were like. And it uh, could be that uh, God, by his Holy Spirit, would cause you to aspire to be like any one of the three. Or even better yet, that there would be a measure of all three of them wrapped into one in your life and in mine. And we can pray that way and we can hope that way. I had the privilege of meeting with our deacons on Sunday evening in order to consider how soon we would begin to meet together again. And we've set a tentative date and I want to let you know about that. A time when we'll come together just for worship services for uh, probably at least a month that we'll begin with. Uh, we'll have services where the entire family will be in the sanctuary together. Uh, we'll not try to do nursery or any of the Sunday school uh, meetings that we would normally do when we assemble together, but just the worship service. And so if you can come and uh, want to be a part of that family time, uh, I trust that the Lord is going to allow us to have a sweet reunion. <laughs> and I can't wait for us to sing the praises of the Lord together again. In order to prepare my heart just before uh, coming on tonight uh, for recording, I listened to This Blood Again by Rachel Chapman. And uh, I can't encourage you enough. If you've not heard that song or seen the post uh, that I put up on, on my Facebook page, uh, that you might go there and listen to her sing that song. Such a phenomenal song. Uh, it so encourages my heart. And uh, just want, I just get so happy listening to what Jesus did for us and considering that. And so, you know, we don't celebrate Easter just once a year. We celebrate it all year long that he got up from the grave, having laid down his life, having poured out his life's blood because that the wages of sin, mine and your sin is death. He took our penalty. He paid the price for you and I. And we can be set free. He wants us to be free. Not free to do what we please, but to be free to do what the Father pleases. And so to prepare my heart, I listened to that song again. And if I act a little bit giddy or a little bit on the happy side, you say, well, this particular message is, is a good message, but why, why are you so excited today or any other day? I tell you, if you get over what Jesus did for you at the cross, oh my goodness, you should never get over that. You should never get over the joy of rehearsing the details of it and the impact of it on your life. And so when we get back together, 
<laughs> I don't know that we're going to be able to sing this blood right off the bat. But somewhere in there, I sure am hoping that Miss Anna <laughs> can work with us uh, as a choir and get us singing that song. I tell you, it just sets my heart afire uh, for the glory of God and wanting to bring him glory. And I can tell you, uh, <laughs> I've got a long way to go, but God has begun to work in me. He's the author of faith in my life, but he's also the finisher. And he's doing a finished work, and it's, I'm afraid it's far from finished yet. And so he's going to have to tarry in his coming while the work is being completed, and you and I. But I want to live for his glory. He said I could have an abundant life. And I'm experiencing that in a measure, and I trust that you are too, and you're looking forward to getting back together. Well, I didn't give you the date, did I? May 17th is the tentative date and here's the thing we're watching along with governor kemp and all the rest to see just what this coronavirus does uh, with our state and with the people of our state and so we're hoping that uh, we've not uh, returned to activities too soon but rather that we're hitting that just about right and of course uh, praying for him. I know that it's a difficult thing to be uh, responsible. And if you make a call and it doesn't turn out just right, guess what? Everybody wants to throw rocks at you. And uh, since we live in glass houses, we ought not to even be picking up any rocks, let alone throwing them at anybody. And we look at what's happened to our nation, and I think we're up above Oh, I don't know. I think I saw somewhere about 64, 65,000 deaths now. It's an amazing thing that has happened. Well, God has allowed it. And so, tell you what, we're just going to keep on praising him. We're going to keep on serving him. And even if he takes one of us out, me or you or another uh, acquaintance of ours, we're still going to keep praising. We're just going to pull a job and say, what? Shall I accept the blessings as if I deserved only that and turn up my nose and want to get a poochy lip attitude about facing adversity? No, indeed. He's prepared me to face exactly that. He didn't promise me a rose garden. I, I've got a rose garden at home. You ought to come by and see it sometime. One of my sisters said they were going to turn me in for the yard of the month. Well, I'm afraid that's a little bit prejudice on the part of my sister, looking at her brother's home and how he's decorating it. But I want to tell you, uh, <laughs> the rose garden that uh, I do come to, he said I, uh, that old hymn that we can sing, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. It's a special thing to get along with him and to begin a day doing that. Because when you begin and get your heart tuned up towards God and his things, today's just naturally going to go better. Amen. Well, before I use up any more of my time, I better get on into John chapter 12. You're just looking at the first 11 verses of that chapter where it says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover. So now this is the Passover that is going to be celebrated just before he's tried on Friday and put to death. So we know it's approaching the end of his life that he came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Wasn't that an awesome event in life? So they made him a supper there. <laughs> Probably if he had raised you or and I a week or two prior from the dead, we'd throw a meal in his honor when he came back through as well. And so that's what they do. And Martha was serving in that always her way. Say, what sort of a believer are you? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you know what the scripture says. If you want to be great, learn to be the servant of them all. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. I tell you, it's sort of nice. And I guess us men folks sort of get a, 
a bit of an advantage over the girls in that regard because he's sitting there uh, face to face or just beside Jesus and reclining at the table and just enjoying that close fellowship with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You get the picture of her doing that such devotion on her part that no expense was too lavish for her that she sacrificially gave in doing this bit of worship of the Lord. We know and find that in the book of Matthew as well as in the book of Mark, they both record that not only did she anoint his feet with that spike nard, but rather she also anointed his head. In fact, the amount of it was so lavish that no doubt that it ran down through his hair and through his beard and dripped onto his feet. And ultimately, she did what a Jewish lady didn't typically do. She took her hair down and with that hair, she began to wipe his feet. So she was bowing at the feet of Jesus ultimately and worshiping him and just lovingly expressing herself to him. And it wasn't just that uh, right there where they were was blessed by the fragrance. The, the odor of that just began to fill the whole house. You know, as I was reading that this afternoon, I began to think about how he describes that mine and your prayers are like incense wafting up to heaven. I always love that word and the, just the, the thought of that and the sight of that, that our prayers are to be making their way up to glory and there are sweet smelling aroma in the nostrils of God. Just this day in which she anoints Jesus, what a sweet smelling aroma and it just filled the house. So you can, are you the kind of believer that your worship of the Lord is just so rich and so sweet that it just kind of permeates the whole household and that where you are, you see one of the sweetest places to worship the Lord is in your house in that special place that you've set aside, where that you anoint the head and the feet of Jesus, and that that sweet aroma of your love for him and your devotion to him, like a Mary, just begins to fill the place, I tell you. And so then when you come together corporately to assemble on a Sunday, when you've worshiped that way in your household individually, day by day, you understand why it's not to be forsaken, the assembling of the believers together. Because when we come together, having been encouraged individually, oh, what a celebration it ought to be. What a celebration it will be when we get together again. We'll not take it for granted like we've done perhaps and have a tendency to do that when it just becomes commonplace that we can get together. Perhaps we begin to take that for granted, but oh no, we're going to be uh, cured of that for a while when we get back together. It says there in verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Wow, what an attitude of love that he expressed for the poor people. But we know that that's really not the true motivation of his heart. But it's an amazing thing, although John chapter 6 says that this Judas, one of the twelve, was a devil. That is that he is one that had not given his life to the father, but rather the father of lies was the true underpinning and motivation of his life and what he said. He didn't want to 
bless the poor with that money, but rather the scripture is going to tell us about him in verse 6. Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. An amazing thing. He was able to deceive all but Jesus. Jesus knew what sort of a fellow he was. And yet his disciples never picked up on it until the very end until he had actually perished, until he had come into the garden and kissed Jesus as his identified way to let the soldiers and the guards know who Jesus was, he kissed Christ and betrayed him. Only then did his disciples finally understand that a devil was among them. They had heard what he said about selling that perf that spikenard perfume and making about 300 denarii with it and giving it to the poor. And oh my goodness, they thought so highly of this Judas who had such a compassionate heart for the poor and they wanted to be like him. Imagine that. As a believer being deceived by another who was no believer at all, but rather merely uh, was looking out for his own self-interest, or so he thought, and wanted to serve himself by stealing what was in the money box. He was the trusted treasurer. And it's an amazing thing that just as in their day and among the 12 disciples, it could happen that someone could be so deceived as that. It can happen in our day as well. And you and I, brothers and sisters, have to pay attention and be discerning souls that the spirit in us gives us a check in our spirit at times. And we ought to be careful sometimes how quick we say the amen, how quick that we are to approve the moves of others in our fellowship, for there are indeed times when there are those among us who are false brethren, who are there merely for their own benefits and having missed the joys and the glories of giving the heart to Christ, they're in our midst and they'll say things but times that we think are just, oh, isn't that sweet? Well, you best be paying attention. What is the source of sweetness? Be a discerning soul and pay attention to what's being said. You neither want to be a Judas nor affirming, nor affirming the activities or the comments or the words of a Judas. Have a discernment about you that is the Holy Spirit in you that throws up a red flag and says, I don't even know what is wrong, what, what was just said or done, but I have a check in my spirit that something's not quite right about that thing. It says, therefore Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Wow. He says, she has anointed me and he's once again given an indication that he's going to be very near to the end of his life when he's going to go to Jerusalem and lay it all down there. <laughs> he says, you guys, he heard what was being said. He heard the praise that was being offered to Judas and such a wonderful deed of worship that Mary had given, when that she had given such an expensive, lavish gift. And the scripture, and I believe it's in the book of Matthew, says that it, this perfume was contained in an alabaster box. Why, the, the, the uh, box itself was a very valuable thing. It was uh, made of a particular kind of marble that was carved out. 
just for keeping just such a valuable essence as she had in it, this spike nard imported from India that would have taken the average laborer's wage, a whole year's worth of labor wages, was being lavished on Jesus. And he says she's done a good thing. And wherever the gospel is preached, people are going to hear about what she did. Say, do you suppose there'll be any action or words of worship that you and I ever do perform in our lifetime that 2,000 years later people will still be talking about it? I suspect not. <laughs> but in the life of Mary, oh, wow, what a precious soul that uh, she was so often found worshiping at the feet of Jesus, just as she had done on this day. He says there in verse 8, For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Well, you've got the opportunity, if you're a mind to, and you've got the resources to do it. You can always lavish gifts on the poor and bless them and help them and take care of them. And indeed, you ought to. But he says you've only just got this little window of opportunity in which you can continue to pour it out on your Savior and Lord, for that's who he is. And he says there, you know, I'm always going to have that. And so take advantage of it while you can. It's just like thinking about our opportunity to get back together and worship together face to face. We're not going to be able to hug each other. How are we going to be that close to one another and not just lay a big old hug and a holy kiss on each other? Well, we're going to have to practice some self-discipline, aren't we? But I'll tell you, I'm looking forward, and I know that you are. And so when May 17th, on the morning of, rolls around, we're going to meet at 11 o'clock, and we're going to spend a wonderful hour together, uh, or, or maybe more, just spend the time that the Holy Spirit leads us to spend, and it's going to be sweet. But it says there in verse 9, the large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there. You can't keep good news down, nor should you. They learned that he was there and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus. You see, word had got out. It was well known that Lazarus had been graveyard dead, and Jesus visited the graveyard and spoke to him, Lazarus, come forth. And so they have come to see him yet again. And so some of those who didn't have the privilege of being present when he came uh, uh, scooting out of that out of that tomb, uh, still wrapped in grave clothes. They're back, having heard about that story, and they're there to see more and hear more about him, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also. It's an amazing thing that in earlier chapters of the book of John, Jesus described these chief priests and the Pharisees and others like them that they were devils, that they were had demonic spirit or attitudes about them, and they were not to be trusted. They were certainly not to be followed nor to be worshipped or put on any pedestal in any sort of a way, but they were planning the death of Lazarus. Here it was that the majority of the people came because they wanted to see this fellow that got raised from the dead. Now, there had been people raised from the dead before, but never one who lay in the grave for four days. You remember even his sister said, don't pull that rock away unless you want to smell a powerful odor, because by now, being dead four days, he's going to stink it, and it won't just be in the tomb, but it'll be all over this environment very quickly. That same one is reclining at the table table with Jesus and folks came to see him. It says there that the 
chief priests wanted to kill him, though. Why? Because there were so many people hearing about that testimony that they were leaving the synagogue in order to follow after Jesus and those who were worshiping him as his disciples. That on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Lazarus, all he had to do was be who he was. And the testimony and the witness of his life was going out. And then, of course, that made it easy because if anybody asked him a question, all he had to do was speak the truth and tell them about the love of Christ that had raised him from the grave. It was an awesome thing that takes place. So you understand, why did they get back together and share that meal together? Well, they just loved Jesus and they loved each other, and they wanted to be together, even as you and I love him, and we, therefore, want to be together. We want to share the stories. We want to share the love of Christ with each other and with anybody that will listen to us and join us. You know, some of our members, Brother Rex and Brother Phil and others, are even in this time of of being away, they're putting together an ability for us to be able to be on YouTube and a live stream. The only problem with that is if the preacher makes any slip-ups or mistakes, he can't very well erase it and go back and say, oops, let me fix that. I'm going to have to fix it on the, on the run. Same as we have to do, I guess, in the service, but it'll be recorded for all time that the preacher made a boo-boo. You know what? You and I both mess up along the way. Lazarus and Mary and Martha were not perfect people, but they were wonderful people. They loved Christ with an everlasting love. The same as you and I, having begun a walk of faith, we serve a risen Savior who's going to continue to perfect that walk in us until the time that we've walked all the way to glory. Now, I'm hoping <laughs> uh, that uh, part of that walk is going to be performed, as it were, with wings. The angel's going to come back and get us. And I don't know how exactly it is that we're going to fly through the sky, but we're going to. And... Uh, Brother K.C. Stevens and Miss Bobby say that multiples of angels arrive to pick up each one of us at our passing. I don't know how all that's going to work out or what all the details are, but it's going to be wonderful through the ages to watch it all unroll, for us to understand all these things that have been being spoken about us in the scriptures for years. We're going to understand it all by and by. <laughs> we'll understand it not better and better, but we're going to understand it perfectly. And he's going to teach us all the intricacies of his love for us and the details of how he worked it out from the foundation chosen you and I were, you know, from the foundation. And he's brought us into that relationship and he's going to do the completing work. Wow, I'm looking forward to being complete, aren't you? I hope that along the way, I learn to be a servant, to be the servant of them all, like a Martha. She wasn't even at her house in this study. She was at Simon, uh, at Simon's house in Bethany. Uh, he was one, too, that suspected that this was probably Simon, one of the lepers that Jesus had cured, who was hosting this at his place. But be that as it may, Mary, Martha was such a servant. She was serving over at Simon's house. And Mary, that most devoted worshiper who lavished and poured the perfume on his head and his feet, it ought to be that all the resources that are available to us, that none of it could be too good 
on our part as an offering to the glory of God, that we pour ourselves out and we pour out all the resources at our disposal, even like a Mary did. And that just like a Lazarus, in whose life Jesus had done such a marvelous work, that we too would have a life of testimony to the glory of God. And we, we'd not be hesitant at all to share it with others. We ought to be anxious and ready to give an account of how we came to believe, what we believe, and why we believe it. Oh, being like these three, I believe as Jesus tarries in his coming, you and I can be more like Martha and more like Mary, <laughs> and gloriously more like Lazarus, and like him we too, one day, will be raised from the grave. I'm looking forward to all of that, and more. I know and I believe that you are too. Say, so if you're listening to me today, and in some wise your appetite has been whetted, you're one of those who's never yet surrendered your heart to Jesus. Can I ask you, do you recognize that you have a problem with sin? And that although the Father hates your sin, He loves you, the sinner, just as you are. And yet He desires for you to jettison that load of sin in your life by faith through trusting placing your faith in Christ. He would desire that the sins of your life would be washed away, washed and made white by the blood of Jesus, that you would be cleansed, that you would live for this glory, and that you would begin to live for his appearing, and that ultimately you'd live eternally by inviting him in to be Lord and Savior. If this is the sort of prayer you'd like to pray, I hope and pray that you will even vocalize this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I know that while you hate my sins, the Bible teaches that you love me in spite of my failures. And Father, I thank you that you loved me with an undying love through what you allowed to be done to your son in the cross. I open the door of my heart and invite Jesus to come in. Your word says you knock and if I open the door you will come in and fellowship with me. Father come into my life take over to be my Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to say to you that if you prayed that prayer and that's the attitude of your heart that you can operate on the authority of the Word of God, that when you ask Him to forgive by faith, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you don't just want Him for fire insurance to miss Him. You want to live for His glory with Him calling the shots in your life as Lord of your life and Savior. I want to tell you, that when you pray that prayer and you place your trust in him, he does indeed save you. He's the God who is mighty to save. Glory. For the believer, celebrate what he's done. Tell about what he's done. Be a servant like Martha. Be devoted like Mary. Give the witness like Lazarus. Amen. Well, glory. Go and have a wonderful day. Keep it on your calendar. Mark it as our date when we intend to get back together for the glory of God. Love you, brothers and sisters. Amen.